I've been using the Sony ZV-E10 for a little over two years and based on my experience, the picture profile that provides the best results with this camera is definitely S-Log2. It produces a very natural looking image with a high dynamic range and a minimal amount of noise when exposed correctly. If you are a complete beginner, I probably wouldn't recommend using this picture profile. However, if you are somewhat familiar with the ZV-E10 or want to learn something new, then keep watching because today I'm going to share with you everything I've learned about S-Log2 on the ZV-E10, including camera settings, various exposure methods to get proper exposure in pretty much any condition, and the color correcting process. Starting with the settings, I almost always shoot an XAVC S4K file format at 25p with 100 megabits per second record setting. This provides me with the highest image quality possible from the ZV-E10. Moving on, my picture profile is set to PP7 with almost everything set to default, except for color mode, which I changed changed to ITU 709 matrix and detail which I reduced to minus 7. I use ITU 709 matrix color mode and not the default as gamut color mode because when I first got the ZV-E10 I was very inexperienced when it comes to log shooting which led me to do a research on YouTube which led me to a YouTube video from Killer Pike aka DSLR video shooter who showed that using the ITU 709 matrix color mode results in less color artifacts than s gamma does. I haven't extensively compared ITU 709 matrix to s gamma color mode, but I'm so used to the ITU 709 matrix workflow that I'm kind of lazy to change it. With this workflow, you don't really need to use any conversion LUTs or color space transforms because it already converts everything in camera. All you need to do is just add some contrast and saturation, which is really simple. However, if you want to be a bit more scientific, you can switch the color mode to s gamma mode and then either download the official Sony LUT from Sony's website or use a color space transform tool like in DaVinci Resolve or something like Cinematch from Film Convert. However, for this video though, I'm just going to stick to using ITU 709 Matrix because I'm so used to it, but all the other things I'm going to share with you in this video are going to work regardless of whether you're using ITU 709 Matrix or s mode color mode. And before you ask, I don't shoot in S-Log3 because it's a bit too demanding for 8-bit Sony cameras like the Sony ZV-E10. Other important camera settings I've changed on the ZV-E10 to make it easier to shoot in S-Log2 are the monitor brightness, which I've set to sunny weather to see everything more clearly, the gamma display assist, which I turned off because I'm shooting in a Rec. 709 color space, the display quality, which I've set to high, and the auto power off temperature, which I've also set to high to get longer recording times without the camera overheating. Also, I have quick access to the metering mode in my function menu so that I can change it if needed. And I remapped button number five, which is the down button on the dial to zebra display select to show high zebras. And button number three, which is the left button on the dial to zebra level to quickly change the zebra levels when necessary. Now let's move on to the most important part when using S-Log2 on 8-bit Sony cameras like the ZV-E10 exposure. Exposing S-Log2 is honestly not that difficult, even though it might seem this way. All you really have to remember is that S-Log2 must be overexposed by about 1 to 2.5 stops to get the cleanest image without too much noise. This is because the sensor inside the ZV-E10 is not that powerful. Again, it can only shoot in 8-bit and it's not designed to be used with S-Log2 or S-Log3. That's why when you expose S-Log2 on the ZV-E10, ZV-E10 with Sony's recommended 32% middle gray level using a gray card, you end up with a significant amount of noise and artifacts in the shadows. By overexposing the image, for example, to a middle gray level of 45%, which is one and one third stops over Sony's recommendation, you automatically lift up the shadows, resulting in less overall noise. Basically, instead of exposing the image correctly at 32% middle gray, and then boosting the exposure in post production which will increase noise because if you artificially boost exposure it will always increase the noise in the image and trust me if you're going to expose your image to 32% middle gray with S-Log2 on this camera you'll always have to add a bit of exposure because the image will be very dark from camera. Instead what you'll do is overexpose the image as bright as possible without losing critical information in the highlights. From my personal experience somewhere between 40 to 45% middle gray 
should work just fine. And then in post-production, you're going to bring the exposure down, which unlike bringing it up, will not introduce any noise to the shot. And also noise usually lives in the shadows from my experience at least. So when you expose it to 32% middle gray, noise is much more noticeable in the shadows because it's much darker. And when you overexpose the shot by one or two or three stops, you're going to elevate the shadows when it comes to exposure and you're gonna see much less noise. However, overexposing s 2 can be a bit tricky, especially if you don't have an external monitor. So first, I want to show you how to expose s 2 correctly to 32% middle gray, like Sony recommends. And then I'm going to move on to show you how to overexpose it by one, two, and three stops. First of all, I highly recommend getting one of these gray cards. They're going to help you a lot when adjusting the white balance and exposure. They're quite cheap. I'll leave a link for one of these down below. Anyhow, this gray card basically represents middle gray, and by using it, you can accurately measure the exposure on the ZV-E10, either with zebras or spot metering. So if you want to set the correct Sony recommended 32 IRE middle gray exposure using zebras with this gray card, all you need to do is go to the display slash auto review page in the menu, select zebra setting, choose zebra level, select either C1 or C2, set the type to standard plus range, reduce the IRE level to 32 and set the range to plus minus two. Afterward, go back to the zebra settings menu and make sure that zebra display is turned on. Again, I remapped these functions to my down and left dial buttons on my camera to make it much quicker and so I won't have to go through the menu every single time I want to enable zebras or change the zebra level. Next, all you have to do is position the gray card where the main subject is going to be and adjust the exposure until zebras show up on the gray card. Once you see zebras on the gray card, it means you are properly exposed to Sony's recommended 32% middle gray level. Alternatively, you can also measure proper exposure by using spot metering. To enable it, go to the exposure menu page, select the metering mode and then choose spot standard. Unfortunately, the spot meter cannot be moved on the ZV-E10, it only works in the center. Therefore, you'll have to position the gray card in the center of the frame over the black spot in the middle and adjust the exposure until the MM icon reads 0.0, .0 on the screen. Once it does, it means that you are properly exposed to the 32% middle gray. Now, another important thing regarding exposure, especially if you are a beginner, I recommend not adjusting the exposure with ISO because it's going to increase the noise in the image. Just stick to the base ISO of 500 as much as you can at least and adjust the exposure either with shutter speed, aperture, or if you want to follow the 180 degree shutter rule, then use an ND filter. I highly recommend this one from Freewell, the Freewell VND filter. I've made a whole video about this filter. You can watch it here. So now that we have a baseline and we know how to correctly expose s 2 to 32% middle gray using a gray card, how do you overexpose s 2 Well, it's really simple actually, just increase the exposure by one, two or three stops using either the shutter speed, aperture, ND filter, or in worst case scenario, ISO. So for example, if your shot has been exposed to 32% middle gray and it uses a one over 100 shutter speed, if you want to over expose it exactly by one stop, you will set the shutter speed to 1 over 50 because 1 over 50 is exactly one stop over 1 over 100. However, just to make it a bit more simple for you and for me, I have already calculated all the numbers you need to know when it comes to setting the zebras on the camera if you want to overexpose 32% middle gray by one stop, two stops and three stops. I'm going to leave all these numbers by the way in a pinned comment down below so you can copy it to your notes app or whatever and just keep it and you'll know exactly if you're using a gray card what IRE levels to use on the zebras to overexpose your shot by one, two, or three stops. So according to my calculations, 43 IRE middle gray will overexpose s 2 by one stop, 53 IRE middle gray will overexpose s 2 by two stops, and 65 IRE middle gray will overexpose s 2 by three stops. If you're using spot metering with a gray card to check exposure, it's actually much easier. You can just use the MM icon on 
the screen. If it says 0.0, .0 that means you are correctly exposed to 32% middle gray. Plus 1 means you're overexposed by one stop. And plus 2 means you're overexposed by two stops. Unfortunately, the MM icon doesn't show when you overexpose or underexpose by three stops. You'll have to use the zebras for that. So basically, use these numbers 32% is going to get you correct S-Log2 exposure, what Sony recommends at least. Then 43% is going to be one stop overexposure and 53% two stops, 65% is going to be three stops. And again, I'm going to leave all these numbers down below. And this is all using a gray card and zebras, of course, in camera. But now, how do you expose your shots correctly when you don't have access to a gray card? Because sometimes you forget it at home or you don't have it on you. Well, there is a solution and the best solution is actually human skin because most likely you're going to shoot yourself. So the skin is the best next thing to use to a gray card. I only use zebras when exposing for skin tones. I find it to be the easiest way to do it. You can also use spot metering, but I prefer using zebras and when i use zebras i set a certain ire volume and then i adjust the exposure until the zebras cover the majority of the brightest part of my face so for example right now the light is from this side when i'll see zebras on this part of my face on the brightest part of my face that means I'm correctly exposed. Here are the IRE values I use with zebras when exposing for skin tones. This will somewhat work with other skin as well, but you'll have to experiment, especially if you have brighter skin than mine or darker skin than mine. So experiment with a gray card and see what works for you. But here are my numbers and they will give you somewhat of a good starting point to start adjusting the exposure with skin tones when shooting in S-Log2 on the ZVE-10. So I use 40 IRE zebras for correct skin exposure, 55 IRE zebras for one stop skin overexposure, 64 IRE zebras for two stops skin overexposure, and 74 IRE zebras for three stops skin overexposure. So it's really simple. If for example, I want to overexpose my skin by two stops, I set the zebras on camera to 64 IRE and adjust the exposure either with shutter speed, aperture, or ND filter until the zebras cover the majority of the highlight part of my face. Now let's move on to exposing landscape shots, mixed lighting shots, and sunset slash sunrise shots. For this kind of shots, I mainly use multi-metering. Multi-metering is not really that accurate. It basically calculates the exposure for the whole frame and it can be really deceiving, so be careful when using it. Anyway, to correctly expose shots with mixed lighting, sunset, sunrise, or landscape shots, I turn multi-metering on and adjust the exposure until I see plus 1.7 to plus 2 on the MM icon on the screen. I also use the display to judge if I'm properly exposed. The ZV-10 doesn't have the most accurate display, but if the image looks way too dark or way too bright, then something is wrong. However, I'm shooting something like this when the camera is directly pointing at the sun. I mainly use the rear display on the camera because in this case, multi-metering becomes pretty much useless because the sun is going to be so bright. The multi-metering is going to show plus two all the time and also zebras are pretty much useless. So you just have to get used to the display with this kind of shots when you have strong sun or strong light in front of the camera. Basically, it all comes down to practice with this kind of of shots. Another way I use to judge proper exposure is by setting the zebras to lower limit 104 IRE. This is because 106 IRE is the white clipping point for s 2 and I want to be as safe as possible. Basically, if I have something very bright slash white in the scene, like white clouds, for example, I increase the exposure until I see zebras on these clouds and then I bring it down until the zebras are no longer visible. Actually, I go a bit lower than that. First, I I overexpose the shot until I clearly see zebras on the white thing, like clouds, for example. Then I reduce the exposure until the zebras are no longer visible. And then I reduce the exposure by another stop or half stop just to be safe because I want to preserve my highlights as much as possible. And I use this in combination with multimetering and also the back display on the ZVE-10. Now, before I move on to color correcting s 2 I want to mention a couple of other things when it comes to overexposing 
exposing SLOG2 on the ZVE10. First of all, overexposing SLOG2 by 2 to 2.5 stops is the maximum I would recommend, especially if the shot involves skin tones. From my experience, the more you overexpose SLOG2, the more the colors shift around, and it's especially noticeable with skin tones. So if you want the best skin tones possible, aim for 1 to 2 stops overexposure. However, if you are shooting landscape shots or sunset shots or something like that, you can overexpose SLOG2 by 2 or even 3 stops. Also, when shooting in SLOG2, I would recommend always using a costume white balance setting, preferably set with a gray card. And you can also shift the white balance slightly towards green because the image on the ZVE10 tends to lean towards magenta. Also, I'd recommend always adjusting the exposure manually. However, if you're doing something like vlogging, where it's not practical to manually adjust the exposure, you can set the camera to aperture priority, choose the desired aperture, and set the exposure compensation to plus 1.7. This will ensure that the shot will almost always be overexposed by 1.7 stops. All right, so now let me show you how I color correct Sony S-Log2 footage inside DaVinci Resolve as quickly and efficiently as possible. So I have here this clip from the Sony ZV-E10 shot in S-Log2 with ITU 709 matrix color mode. Let's start. First thing I always do is open the waveform and adjust the exposure. This clip was definitely overexposed, I would say by about 1.5 to 2 stops. So I'm going to start by bringing down the exposure to around something like here. And then I'm going to go to the curves and add some contrast and I'm going to make sure the editable splines are turned on to make the transition between the highlight adjustments and shadows adjustments a bit more gradual and smooth. Alright, I think I am done. This is the before and after before and after as you can see a big difference and only used basically two tools the offset wheel in here to adjust the exposure and then the curves to add some contrast next thing i always do is adjust the white balance and i think this shot is definitely leaning more towards green and also yellow so i'm going to subtract some green and yellow let me go here i'm gonna shift it towards blue just a bit and also add some magenta. Let me also open the vector scope just to make sure I'm properly white balanced. I usually use this uh, center tool in here to make sure the blob I have in here is basically in the center. I think somewhere around here looks good. This is the before and after before and after. Now, if I had some skin tones in the shot, I would use this node to correct the skin tones because the skin tones from the Sony ZV-E10 usually lean towards magenta and I always have to fix the skin tones on the ZV-E10. So I would just open this node, go here, go here, hue versus hue curves, select the skin tones and basically push the skin tones towards yellow slash orange. Or I would isolate the skin tones with the HSL mask if I had similar colors in the background and do basically the same thing. But here I don't have any skin tones, so I'm just not going to touch anything. Now finally, what I always do is I add some saturation basically in here with the saturation slider. Let's go about here and I think I am pretty much done when it comes to color correcting this shot. This is the before and after, before and after. Now if I would have used the default SK mode color mode, I would definitely use a color space transform tool and do all these nodes below it to work in the widest dynamic range possible. So let me show you how it works. Let's label it CST. And basically in DaVinci Resolve, you have this tool called Color Space Transform. I think it's only available in the paid version, but I'm not really sure. Or in here, you can also use the free Sony LUT. So in this tool, I would put Sony SK mode. Then I would put SLOG2 and then I would put REC709 because I want to convert SLOG2 to REC709. And then I would put REC709A because I'm using a MacBook, but if you are using a Windows computer, just use Gamma 2.4. Now it looks weird because I'm using the other nodes in here, but if I'm going to disable all these, so if I was using the default as gamut color mode, I would definitely use a color space transform and then work all these nodes below it to work in the widest dynamic range possible. You don't want to do these adjustments after the transform because 
you're going to work in the narrow Alexa Alexa 9 color space. You basically want to have the widest dynamic range available when adjusting colors, exposure, etc. But in this case, I'm not going to use this because I showed this with the ITU 709 matrix color mode. So let me enable everything. Now to color grade this clip, I would either add a creative LUT or in my case, I actually prefer using the Dehancer plugin, which is basically like a film emulation plugin. And as you can see, you can select like film profiles and whatnot. You can adjust many things. You can even add like grain and stuff to your footage if you want to. You can also adjust the intensity. I highly recommend this plugin. It's really amazing, especially if you love film emulations that people use in Hollywood. Looks fantastic. I really love using it. But yeah, basically this is it. Nothing really fancy, adjusting the exposure, adding some contrast, adjusting the white balance, adding some saturation, and then adding a lot, a creative lot, or in my case, using the Hanser to basically create a look. Actually, I also have a LUT for the Sony ZV-E10 that will basically do the color correction for ITU 709 matrix for you. It will adjust the contrast, exposure, add some saturation, but it will not fix the white balance because each shot is going to be different. So I cannot really predict what white balance setting you're going to use. But if you're interested in these LUTs, I'm going to leave a link down below. I hope this video was informative and useful to you. If you have any questions or comments or whatnot, let me know down below. And I guess I'll see you in the next one. Peace.